On this week's Jeep Talk Show, a familiar Jeep makes KBB's best resale value list. And actor James Woods credits his Jeep for saving his life. I reviewed the DLA and we have an exclusive interview with the manufacturer. We've got your voicemails and reviews. Nikki G calls in and we'll answer some of your tech questions. Cody is back with an all new grand adventure as well. John talks about multiband radios on a new radio Comtech. I teach you some easy troubleshooting tips for testing the throttle position sensor on your 4 liter. And we'll have some good laughs coming up on episode 207 of the Jeep Talk Show. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show. With Tammy on Wrangler. Tony and Josh on Cherokee. So sit back. Strap in. And brace yourself. First week in G. Well, the Jeep Wrangler has been named on KBB's.com's 2016 Best Resale Value List. Now, everybody knows that the moment you drive off a dealership lot in your fancy schmancy brand new Jeep, it automatically loses the majority of its value. It's scary truth we all have to face when we consider purchasing a new vehicle. So it's important to look at the vehicles that retain their resale value extremely well. That's where Kelly Blue Book's 2016 KBB.com's Best Resale Value List comes in handy. Every year, KBB.com posts a list of the vehicles in each segment that will keep their value well. This year, the 2016 Jeep Wrangler made a lasting impression in the compact SUV crossover segment, which is weird because I didn't think it was either. The Wrangler established itself as a true American icon, retaining 64.3% of its value over the course of 36 months and 53.9% of its value over 60 months. With a no-frills base Wrangler Sport trim starting with a base price tag just under 25 grand, you might say that this rugged Jeep's resale value is quite the number. And the fact that many Wrangler owners add aftermarket parts to make it even more off-road ready and the Jeep Wrangler will definitely get you more bang for your buck, as if you needed any more reason to buy a Jeep. <laughs> Actor James Woods, yeah, you know that name, says his Jeep Grand Cherokee saved his life. Many people know that our four-wheel drive vehicles are particularly useful when it comes to traveling in winter weather. But famous Hollywood actor James Woods actually credits his Jeep Grand Cherokee for saving his life recently in Colorado. According to his official Twitter account, Woods was traveling down the Glenwood Canyon part of I-70 Monday. That, that part has a 6% grade and no shoulders. Sounds lovely driving for a winter storm, right? Well, he was heading west when a vehicle doing what he said was about 75 plus miles per hour in front of him spun out on a patch of black ice. To avoid the spinning car, Woods swerved right, hitting the guardrail, then did a 180 degree spin across the roadway and hit the guardrail on the other side of the road, backwards at about 60 miles per hour. Playing pinball is a lot of fun, but not in vehicles, even in a Jeep. And in case you were wondering, no, the gas tank did not rupture. <laughs> the actor sent a tweet in which he expressed gratitude for that guardrail not failing. Huge drop, 100 feet in the river below, but the guardrail held. I managed to pull out and slide down out of oncoming traffic. Six car pileup. Hmm. Counting his own car, there were seven cars involved in the accident, but officers told Woods that he was the only person not to collide with another vehicle. Woods said that nobody died in the accident, but he did say he felt pretty banged up and even apologized for what he called rambling, citing that he may have had a little concussion. Woods also had very nice things to say about the emergency responders who attended to those involved in the accident, as he wrote via Twitter, and I quote, Every person I dealt with here in Colorado was just superb, professional, and caring. The 68-year-old actor who starred in many films and TV shows also wrote that he had winter tires equipped on his Grand Cherokee and that he had his vehicle inspected religiously. If it wasn't for those tires and maybe really good maintenance uh, history and the ability of the Jeep, who knows what would have happened. Now, we don't know the exact year the Grand Cherokee was driving, but in a tweet, he referred to it as, quote, an old tank which makes me think it might have been a Wagoneer, but I don't know. In any case, I bet it's his favorite rig of all time now. <laughs> Woods released the following tweet again on Tuesday, simply saying, on the road again. Hats off to James Woods for handling this whole ordeal very calmly and professionally. And Mr. Woods, if you're listening, we'd love to have you on the show to share your story. Hey, if you guys have a uh, story that you think we should be talking about or you have a response to any one of our stories on This Week in Jeep, please send an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. So did you get the feeling that the uh, the Cherokee made it? I mean, the Grand Cherokee made it? 
it sounds like that would. Uh, it, it, I don't know. It just didn't sound like it was going to be. A, it was a goner from uh, from that. The the that word trip. total. I, I did uh, do a, a brief skim of his Twitter account uh, in regards to this story, and uh, and the word totaled was in there. Okay. Uh, so, but, but whether we, that means it was just banged up really bad, because I mean, you get in a fender bender and you get out, and you're looking at your car and like, oh, geez, this thing's totaled, and it's just a couple grand worth of work. Uh, but if you had a guardrail backwards at 60 miles per hour, I would have to say that that's going to be totaled. Yeah, well, w- and we all know, uh, at least we know somebody that uh, totaled their vehicle, bought it back from the insurance company, and continue to drive it the t- today. So. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, sometimes the insurance version of totaled is not our version of totaled. Right. It's uh, it's amazing what uh, what passes off as, uh, as totaled, and you go, oh, well, yeah, it could be expensive. I guess it's when it's professionally done uh, is what what totals it. If you if you got a buddy with a frame stretcher and uh, a little background and uh, a couple hundred bucks or fifteen hundred bucks later, uh, you're all good as new. Uh, I uh, I spun mine um, back when uh, I guess it was about nine years old and uh, hit uh, backwards into a a huge retaining wall mm. and uh, crunched it. Uh, they had to reskin the uh, rear quarter panel passenger side. And, Your current uh, Jeep? Yes. And, oh, wow. uh, yeah. And then, uh, I was told red was one of the hardest, to, uh, colors to match, but I can't yeah. tell, I can't tell that it was, uh, that uh it was ever a good red. shop then. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, uh, uh I, I guess it's a good testament to where, I, where I went friend of the family that uh, did that for me. You're listening to Jeep talk show, the number one Jeep podcast at my mom's house. XJTalk.com. XJTalk.com. It's where you go when you're not off road. Coming up tonight on Wrangler Talk, a Jeep Talk Show Scoop, an exclusive interview with a company who designed a new device for off roading for the off roading community, and I reveal how I played a part in the design of this product. Ooh, must be something womanly. Hey, I'm the engineer in this group here. What are you doing <laughs> stepping on my toes? You're, you're getting on my territory here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I guess it's happening on the East Coast this time, Josh. You're rubbing off yeah. on me, Josh. Apparently. It's, it's, I'm rubbing off nationwide. Ooh, that came out bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> coming to a truck stop near you. Uh-huh. So uh, let me tell you about the 4x4 Radio Network. Yes, the, please. Uh, the Jeep Talk Show, <laughs> the 4x4 Podcast, Center Steer, which is Land Rover stuff. Uh, the Money Microphone Podcast, ATVs, uh, motorcycles, all kinds of fun things off-road, have joined forces and created a network. We'll be adding more shows to the lineup soon, and you can visit the 4x4radionetwork.com and listen to all these great podcasts simply by pl- pressing the play button. There's no better place to get all your 4x4 information. That's the 4x4radionetwork, www.4x4radionetwork.com. So, you know, we all love hearing from you. So be sure to call our voicemail at 530-675-4102. Or, you know, you can jump over to our website at thejeeptalkshow.com and leave us a message. Just click on the send questions and question, send questions and comments button. And tonight we have several to share with you. Yep, yep. And uh, listen to these guys. You'll, you'll hear a difference in the uh, audio quality. Because one of them is from our website, that speak pipe thing that Tammy was talking about. And the other one is from that number. So see if you can tell which is which. Hey, this is Tony. And I'm Tammy. And this is Josh. And you've reached our 24-7 voicemail line. You guys know what to do. So at the beep, leave your message. Hey, guys. I'm a former Jeep owner. I owned a 2002 TJ with a small lift on it. And I think... 34s maybe is what I had on I don't remember anyway I had it for a few years had to sell it when the kids came along I need something bigger but I've been thinking about getting it another one one of the things I didn't like about my old Jeep was that once I put the lift kit on it seemed to wander around the highway more and if I hit the brakes it would kind of follow the crown of the road and head towards the ditch I live in Portland Oregon and uh, the highways around here aren't great they kind of rut it up from all the traffic and that seemed to affect the Jeep a little bit Curious what your thoughts are on 
whether I should get a new JK with a 3.6 or the older T TJ with a 4 liter. Um, I'm leaning towards trying to find a Rubicon Unlimited 05 or 06 to get the longer wheelbase and still keep the 4 liter, but from listening to your show a couple weeks ago, you thought maybe the 3.6 didn't have the longevity that the 4 liter had. So curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, this will have to be, be my da daily driver, so I do want to have some decent road manners, um, but I will be taking it on some off-road trips. I ride a dual sport motorcycle now, and I'd like to bring the kids along for some of this stuff, and so I think a Jeep would be a good vehicle to do that in. Um, anyway, look forward to hearing what you guys have to say and really enjoy the podcast. Keep it up. Thanks. Well, Tammy, take the, take the lead on this one since you have the, uh, the JK knowledge. And actually, you know, I posted the question some, to some friends about the 3.6 and the 3.8. And it sounds like the 3.6 is the better than the 3.8. Um, they said, I'm looking it up right now. They said that the 3.6 motor was um, a proven motor with the, the Mercedes line before it was adopted by Jeep, and it's been around a lot longer than people think. And a lot of the people that I, I kind of did a little survey, and they say it's lasted a longer than 100,000 miles. So I think it's the 3.8 that may have the issues. Now, I'm not speaking from experience for myself, just from just like a little survey that I did. Mm -hmm. But I will say, and I have no experience with the older model Jeeps, but I love my, um, my Rubicon. And I feel like driving, comparing the Rubicon to the Sahara, just, and they both have the same engine, that the the torque power that it has going slow over those rocks is amazing. And I could tell the difference in the Rubicon than the Sahara. Now, I don't know if why that is, because they both have the same engine. Um, yeah. The gearing is higher, isn't like, it? Yeah. The, pardon? The, the, Rubicon, the Rubicon has much deeper gears uh, in the transfer case. Right. Than, uh, well, than yeah, you're though. right. You're right. Um, so you're going to get a bit more power transfer whenever you're uh, in low. On the Rubicon. Right. So I think that's where you're seeing that. And I, I don't know. I I do not have experience well, with older Jeeps, but I love my new Rubicon. I love it. I don't it. know what uh, what Dave's budget's like. Uh, and, and well, although he's talking about Wranglers. Well, that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what... Uh, I, I don't know what his budget's like, and, and, and I've driven some Wranglers. I mean, I've driven some, uh, some, uh, some JKs. I've driven TJ. I've driven just about every Jeep on the planet. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, I might give you a third option to explore, Dave. Um, what about the LJ? Uh, basically, it's a it's a scrambler version of the TJ. Look, the TJ is a great vehicle, and I'm going to be the first one. Everybody knows I'm a huge supporter of the 4-liter. I think it's one of the best engines on the planet. And uh, that being said, you can find really good TJs out there. I mean, the guy uh, who I work with who, uh, who picked up and then we built the, the Northwest Metal Cloak TJ uh, that thing had less than 20,000 miles on it when he bought it. Uh, so it just goes to show you that there are some rarities out there. You can find them. Uh, and living here in Portland, uh, you're my backyard, buddy. Uh, so you know as well as I do, there's a lot of rust-free Jeeps out in this area as well. Just got to do your research. You'll be able to find one uh, that will suit your needs well. Yeah, I'll have to go the, the, the way of the TJ. Uh, from my understanding, there's a couple of things that make the, the TJ a, a much better choice than, than the JK. Uh, it's uh, thicker metal. Uh, the uh, the metal, the the uh, body panels and stuff on the uh, JK JKU are thinner. You know that was uh, uh, Jeep's attempt to uh, make things lighter, but that also means that things will uh, bend easier. And uh, the thing that really has turned me off on the JKs and the JKUs is this recent uh, thing that I found out about the uh, the problem with the 3.8s and the 3.6s, uh, which. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that here in uh, upcoming shows. Uh, I was really surprised to find out that it is a, a very common thing for those not to last over 100,000 miles. And in my book, if it's a Jeep, <laughs> unless it's the four-cylinder, you're looking at something that lasts two or 300,000 miles. It's supposed to anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, uh, it, it's, it's pretty sad. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. And uh, the 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 only recommendation he had was put a Hemi in it. Uh, <laughs> in other words, don't have a three point eight or a three point six. 
And uh, those kits start, uh, Josh, I think you and I were chatting about this uh, online, that those kits start around five to $6,000 just before you get the engine to put in it. Yeah, yeah, no, they can get pretty spendy. So, uh, and, and of course, you know, it goes up from there depending on how, how far you want to go with that sort of thing. But right. uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of options out there. Uh, Dave, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you in person about that. Uh, feel free to uh, shoot me a, a private message. Just send an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com and uh, we can exchange contact information. I'll be happy to, uh, to help you out. Right. Let's jump All on. I can say is just I would go for the Rubicon. <laughs> well, they do make uh, Rubicon TJs, so that, that's also another good way of looking at it. So let's get over to our next voicemail. Hey, this is uh, PA Jeep Freak. I have two questions. The first one is when is Jeep Mama going to get one of the new purple Jeeps? Is she going to trade <laughs> in or just buy a new one? And the other thing is, I listen to the Jeep Talk to show in my man cave. <laughs> okay. oh, I like that. I was I like, like why that. Do we, why do we keep, oh, that's for the, where do you listen to your Jeep Talk show? Yep, exactly. Took me a while. I'm a little slow. So you got a purple one out there yet, uh, Tammy? I know you're working on it bit by bit. Yeah, you know, I've been going back and forth and back and forth. And actually, the purple backcountry Rubicon does not have the um, anti-sway bar disconnect and really? it does not have the the locker it does not have the ten thousand dollar buttons let me just say so that's why I bought my Rubicon so I think I'm just gonna have to not trade in my Rubicon my black Rubicon and just maybe st- Stick with changing the black parts with purple parts. You you would have to if you had a purple Jeep, you would have to accent it with another color. That would just yeah. screw everything up, wouldn't it? That I mean, would black that to would purple just mess back my, to black again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd be going for black grills instead of purple grills. No, I think I'm just gonna stick with my black Jeep. And you know, someone brought up a good point. Now that Jeep has this purple Rubicon or this purple Jeep, maybe they'll start coming out with purple accessories that we can use because I do want to paint my interior with purple highlights. So maybe they'll start coming out with that. Oh, that'd be interesting. That way you have one can only hope, but it's going to not, it won't be the right color purple, Tammy. We all know. Well, actually the purple that's on my Jeep right now is called plum crazy purple. Makes sense. And it, the (laughs) person who, the person who painted it is an auto body painter, and he uses the purple paint from the Dodge Charger. <laughs> and you guys know who make the Dodge Charger, right? The same people who make the Dodge Charger makes the Jeep, and it's I'm pretty sure it's the same purple. Those pretty sure so. it's the same purple. Those weren't oh, the, well, it's probably a shade thereof. The, those weren't the same people yeah. that started making the Jeep, though, Tammy. They, they bought it later on. No, so, but I, I think it's the same purple. I'm yeah, pretty sure it's is. the same purple. So let's get over to our, uh, our third voicemail. Do you drive a Jeep? Do you love to fish? Then the Real Rack is just for you. I'm Alex, and my company sells the Real Rack. It's a patent-pending spare tire cover that holds up to four fishing poles safely in your spare tire with built-in safety bungees and straps. It custom-fits all tires, size 29-inch through 40. It's on sale right now with 10% off, free shipping, free assembly, and a free t-shirt at www.radoffroad.com. That's www.radoffroad.com. And you can find it right on my homepage. Thanks. So I don't know if you guys have seen that Geico commercial where uh, the little uh, uh, green gecko is uh, ordering, uh, has ordered Chinese food in his New York apartment. And oh, the, yeah. the I guys, haven't seen that one yet. The guy's shoving the stuff in. It, it, I think it's the same guy that, uh, that called in. <laughs> He's got that same. He was serious, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys got to check out these real rack covers. Uh, heads over your, um, uh, just over your spare tire on the back of your Jeep. Holds four reels. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty stout. They even got some other cool stuff on there. Checking out this Eclipse Sunshade right now with the American flag for the JKs. That's some cool stuff. Yeah, check them out. Uh, the uh, They found us on Twitter and uh, I said, hey, give us a call into our voicemail. Let us know about your product. So uh, they took us up on it. So thank you. That was uh, pretty cool. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to... Uh, uh, call in and uh, promote your product. Cool site, radoffroad.com. So, you guys, another cool site that you want to check out is going to be our YouTube channel, and we're always updating it, youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. It's where you go where you guys can find our broadcast. In fact, we are streaming live on YouTube every Thursday, 10 p.m. Central. 
You can watch us there live during the show, or we encourage you to head over to jeeptalkshow.com and watch us live there through the YouTube stream player that is on our site. You can also interact with the hosts and other fans of the show through our chat room there. You can always leave comments on our YouTube channel's uh, videos. We'll get those, and of course, if those comments uh, make it to the air, you guys can look forward to hearing your own words uh, right here on the Jeep Talk Show. Yep, yep. So youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. You know, Josh, I like watching the uh, the subscriber count uh, on the on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel. And uh, we were just shy of, you know, hitting uh, the next uh uh, just 10. shy of not enough just is what that is. yeah it always is but but we were i was story we, of my life we, we were getting to to nine whatever the number was i forget now but it was nine, nine and i was waiting nine. for it to go to zero you know and it didn't oh. it stayed at nine then it went to eight then it went to seven i'm like oh. what the hell oh what's going on here <laughs> it's going backwards so don't so go that's backwards a, that's a good good indication guys that we're going to need your help with those subscriptions hey tell a friend get your buddies to subscribe to our youtube channel as, as well uh, you guys won't regret it so don't go backwards, go forward. And by doing so, you need to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Well, another thing that you guys are going to subscribe to here is this show each and every week. And we've got another tech segment for you coming up right now. Radio Com Tech with the one and only John, pre-runner 1982. And now it's time for some Radio Com Tech. Another warrior is on the mesa. This is John, pre-runner 1982, and on today's Radio Comtech segment, I'm going to respond to an email from a fan, or a casual listener, or he stumbled across the show and he decided to send me an email. Chris from Knoxville, Tennessee writes, Greetings, John. Great ham segment on Jeep Talk. I'm studying for the technician class test. I currently run a CB in my semi. Is there a way to combine the two so I don't have another radio to swap in and out? Well, Chris, thanks for the email and the kind words on the segment. And yes, you can have an all-in-one radio. An all-band, all-mode ham radio can be modified to be used in the uh, CB uh, frequency. Fortunately, it's not legal to do so, and the radio can be quite expensive. And as a technician, you wouldn't have the privileges to use um, really all the frequencies that that, uh, such a radio would offer. So uh, you could either upgrade to a general and get uh, more use out of such a radio for the price you'd be paying for it, or um, you can get a dual band radio. Now, as a technician, it would uh, have the two frequencies you'd probably use the most, two meters and 70 centimeters. And at most dual band mobile radios, the uh, control head actually can be separated from the body of the radio so that the body can be mounted under the passenger seat and in the dash, under the dash, under the console, wherever. And the control head can be mounted on, on the dash or between the visors, you know. Most dual band mobile radios aren't much larger than a compact CB. And given the fact that the control head can be separated, it's really not much radio to find a place to mount. So like I said, all in one, Yeah, it can be done, but a uh, dual band mobile radio may be your best option if you're only going to have your technician license. So Chris, if you have any other questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer them for you. And if anybody else has any questions, send me an email, prerunner1982 at yahoo.com. This is John, prerunner1982, clear. Boy, he's really plugging that prerunner1982, isn't he? I love that guy. (laughs) Yeah, he's great. I love his voice. Yeah, no, he's right. definitely got a good set of pipes on him, and he's got a head full of knowledge right there. Uh, John's always coming up with great radio com tech advice for us, keeping our communications crystal clear. So uh, I'll just uh, mention that uh, what John was saying was correct. You can get an all band radio. Uh, the uh, it's it's a bit old now, but the ICOM seven hundred six. Um, you can remove a I think it's a, a resistor, maybe a diode. And uh, it makes that general uh, coverage receiver into a general coverage transmitter. So any place that you can receive, you can transmit. Doesn't necessarily mean you have the right antenna uh, for it, but the the transmitter will uh, will work wherever you wherever you're listening. So that includes the FM broadcast band and uh, weather uh, band and <laughs> everywhere else. So you have to be really careful with that. Uh, but we all know that in a case of emergency, you can transmit anywhere the hell you want to, and it's legal. It's like uh, Rule number one in the FCC uh, rule book. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's why I opened mine up because I uh, certainly have mine in my, my Jeep for emergency communications. Uh, but uh, I would not advise using it uh, for a, a CB radio 
Uh, so I think, though, that what you'll find is if you get a general class license and you're able to get on the HF bands and talk anywhere in the, the world, certainly in the country, uh, while you're uh, driving down those uh, interstates, you'll find that it is a lot more fun talking on uh, those bands where you don't have to uh, elbow your way through a bunch of, uh, well, I'll just say it this way, 58,000 other screaming idiots uh, <laughs> to, to, have, to make a conversation. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, talking on the, the HF band, driving on the road, would be a, a lot more pleasurable than uh, getting on 11 meters or the, the chicken band. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? What are you talking about, man? Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? I got no idea what the heck. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Get out of my face, yo. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Underwater. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? In the bubble bath. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? No clue. And where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? While flexing on stumps. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? I would assume on the radio. The Jeep Talk Show, available on iTunes and at jeeptalkshow.com. I've heard that voice in the bathroom from time to time. <laughs> Bellowing from the bathroom fan vent. <laughs> well, that, that, that would explain a lot. <laughs> So, you know, something every week that we look forward to. You sound depressed is- when you say every. <laughs> well, every uh, week. Rewind. Come on. Something we all look forward to there each and every week is hearing from the mind of Nikki G. Poor Nikki G. It's Christmas. Give Nikki G a little hope. Uh, I <laughs> a love little Nikki hope. G. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G, and uh, I agree with Tony. Of course. Uh, I'm not for the Jeep Club. I uh, don't care for it. Never been in one, but I just don't like the thought of it. You know, I've never been hit with a Jeep Club, but I've been beaten with a few baseball bats <laughs> and even a few uh, stickball sticks, and just and sticks in general, and uh, it hurts. I imagine a Jeep Club would hurt even more. And uh, so we'll move on from that. I know. <laughs> he just what got it, I Josh. <laughs> I'm trying to multitask uh, over here. Josh, you <laughs> he gave me some uh, advice on my control arm bushings, and I decided not to take it. I'm just going to let it squeak and squeak until uh, my wife can't take it no more. Don't Demand I do it? something about it, and then I'm just going to go out and get some new adjustable control oh, arms. He's got a plan. So it's my way of squeezing a few bucks out of her. Smart man. And, uh, well, we're talking about women, Tammy. I know you have some oh, no. man child, so you probably know, already know this. But it's uh, advice for all the other women listeners out there. If you ask your man to do something, rest assured he'll do it. There's no need to remind him every six months. All right, guys, I'll uh, chat you later, and you have a good one. Bye. What was that meme that I saw? The first female referee, football referee, was uh, calling uh, things that happened three years ago, <laughs> throwing oh. flags on things that happened three years ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remind him every six months. I remind him one time, and then I just do it the next day. And then in the, in the six months, need he needs to, to remind about. himself. I don't okay. want to do it more than need, once. I don't need to worry about it then. <laughs> but you do. Well, actually, he's probably figured me out. He's like, I'm not going to do it in the next five minutes. She'll no. do it herself. That, that's exactly right. Or you, or you act like you're going to do it and make a mess, and then it's taken care of uh, from I, then on. Like, God dang it. Just get out of the way. Move. Well, let's get out of the way for our second Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And as uh, maybe you already know that, uh, Wendy and I work for an airline. And it was, this is the travel season. A lot of people travel just once a year for the holidays, and this is it. So I figured I'd just uh, call in and give uh, some advice for the people who are just traveling. Uh, first tip is... Uh, when you get to the airport, sit down, buckle up, and shut up. We don't want to hear your problems. We have all our own problems. We work, we work for an airline, for Christ's sake. And the uh, second tip is get cargo pants. Put all your belongings in that. We have our own baggage. We don't need to deal with yours. And when you hand your bag to the ticket agent, uh, say goodbye to it. Cause that's probably the last time you're going to see it. But if you're traveling through Charlotte, make sure you pack some uh, some shoes ten wide, because uh, Nikki needs a new pair of shoes. 
<laughs> okay. All right, guys, I'll uh, chat you later. You guys have a good one. Bye. <laughs> when he said 10 wide, I thought he was talking about actually putting pairs of shoes next to each other, 10 pairs 10 wide. wide. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 10 wide. Okay. So I got it now. Must have run tip. over his feet with a, an airplane. And tip number three, do not bring your pepper spray with you. Oh, yeah. Very true. Uh, you could, uh, even if you like your, your food extra spicy. Yeah. Not a good idea. You're listening to a 4x4 four by four, four by four Radio Network Podcast. Ooh, reviews. We always like the reviews, yeah. uh, especially during uh, whenever a Star Wars movie is coming out, for you people to focus <laughs> long enough to give us a review. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with the Star Wars movie releasing, you know, um, just any moment now, now. today. Yeah, exactly. Then, people uh, are watching it right now. That's true. So, uh, you know, they're having a, a showing every 15 minutes at a place here in Houston. Even oh, at three and four o'clock in the morning, they they're doing Good like Lord. two days of starting the Star Wars movie every fifteen minutes. Now I don't know if that means you get fifteen minutes and you have to get the hell out or buy another ticket, which would be make make sense for the profit standpoint. But uh, I don't know how many got, screens they I got, got a, in that place. Got a theater out here that's doing the entire trilogy back oh. to back to back to back, sixteen hours of Star Holy Wars cats. leading up leading up to the premiere. Can so, you imagine? So do you get to do no, s- spit can't. wads at Jar Jar Binks? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I yeah, there I, I wonder how they do intermissions and stuff. That's just uh that's Well, I know I mean. folks here in in my area have already seen the whole movie and they're on their way home. I'm interested in hear, hearing the reviews. Uh, somehow I'm thinking it's going to be disappointing. Although uh, some of the cinematography that I've seen uh, looks very stunning. Of course, you should expect nothing less from a movie these days cuz all the computer oh, totally. stuff that's out there. So anyway, let's talk about reviews. Uh, well, we started talking about it. Uh, Tammy, we actually have a iTunes review tonight, don't we? Yep. It's a Jeep podcast, five stars by NV24. One That'd be N- NV241OR. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the transfer case. Oh, New is venture. That, what that is? Okay. Any December 11th, 2015. I facepalm myself in my cubicle whenever a corny joke is told. Thank you. So do I. This <laughs> happens so frequently that my coworkers think I'm insane. Yeah, pretty much happens to me all the time. I, <laughs> I, I listen to podcasts regularly, including this one, and I'll even laugh at my own jokes, uh, which I do here on the show even on <laughs> Rare, rare yeah, occasion, you me both. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm the same way. I, I work in an open office, and and I got engineers all around me, and I'll just for what they think is no reason whatsoever, just bust into hysterics, and and of course, you know, everybody looking over me like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? And, and I've got a loud <laughs> laugh, and I love the laugh, and uh, and I do it all the time, especially at work, because uh, yeah, you know, you listen to the show, you listen to other things, and uh, when things get funny, you got to laugh. So. Uh, Thank you very much, NV241OR. Appreciate uh, appreciate those kind words. And if you guys want to give a review, head over to iTunes, give us that five-star review, and leave us a comment. We'll be sure to read it on the show. Now, something else we're going to be reading on the show right now, well, it's time for me to shut up and get out of the way so that we can do some Wrangler Talk. Shut up and listen. Shut up. And- so shut up. You don't shut Man. up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler Talk. It's time for G Mama. Okay, so last week I told you guys about my meetup with Chris from Jeep's Needs. He was demonstrating to me a new product for the off road community called the DLA or D Lift Adapter. The DLA is a device the folks at Jeep's Needs designed to make using the high lift jack much safer in off road conditions. So what you do is you utilize the D-rings or shackles on your aftermarket bumper as a lift point. Now the DLA connects your high lift to the Jeep via the D-rings by locking everything together. So basically it locks the jack to the Jeep for much safer lift. It is also constructed with a 2-inch diameter grooved polycarbonate top piece to provide the operator the additional flexibility to to use the high lift and other parts of the Jeep as lift points, such as your tubular rock sliders or your bumper. Now, the DLA is $160, and some folks claim that's quite pricey. I did address that that issue with Chris in my interview, which we'll get to in a moment. 
And I would also like to point out that this device is constructed as a, with a single piece of steel, cold rolled and bent into shape with no casting or welding. Plus it has a non-marring polycarbonate surface, which I mentioned before, and it's power coded in several colors and a special new color coming out <laughs> soon, which I'll tell you about again in a minute. So, you know, actually Chris and I met up twice. The first demonstration didn't go too well. We were using my Warren D ring, which I received from Jeep when I traded in my Sahara for my Rubicon. Jeep was given away, giving away um, recovery kits, and included in these recovery kits were these Warren D rings. Now, these Warren D rings did not fit into the DLA. They are a little wider and a little shorter than most D rings. So Chris took the DLA back to his guys at Jeep's Needs, and they did a few modifications to the product. So during my second interview with Chris, we had a chance to talk about our first meetup and what adjustments Jeep's needs made, made to the D-ring. Jeep's needs is really hard to say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you can find part of that interview on my blog post from yesterday at www.jeepmama.com, and that's M-O-M-M-A. -M -M -A. So Tony and Josh, that wasn't the only thing Chris and I chatted about. So here are some highlights of my exclusive Jeep talk show interview with Chris from Jeep's Needs, including the question of the $160 cost of the DLA and how the DLA will handle in an off-camber situation. Say, you know, why would I spend $160 on something for a high lift jack when I spend $80 on a high lift jack? It's engineered to be more strong than your jack, right? So um, as a matter of fact, in the uh, static load testing of this, they took it to somebody who tested the strength, how much it could handle, how much weight it could take, and the jack broke before the DLA broke. It's not worth using a high lift without it. And once people understand the value of the product, then the $160 really is chump change. So Tony and Josh, like I said, this is just some of the exclusive interview only heard here on the Jeep talk show interview and demonstration with Chris from Jeep's needs about their product of the DLA. You can head over to the Jeep talk show YouTube channel later for more on the DLA. We're going to upload the longer version of this interview and demonstration. You can also see for yourself how the DLA works and how it will handle in off camper situations. So earlier I mentioned I played a part in the design of the DLA. When Chris and I first met up so he could demonstrate to me how the DLA worked, we tried using my D-ring on my Jeep, but it didn't work. So they took it back to the drawing board and made some, modif some small modifications. The issue was these worn D-rings are a little wider and a little shorter. And so they had to widen the opening of the DLA and they also made the little the holes where you put the pin in just slightly bigger to account for the high lift jack. Some of the casting models are a little different. To thank me for my help, which honestly I felt wasn't really a help at all, but it was an indirect help to them, they decided to add another color to their selection. They have a wide selection of colors like yellow, red, orange, pink, um, but there's one color they didn't have. So they decided to add another color to their selection and they're gonna let me pick that color. So right now I'm in the process of looking up paint samples. Once I pick the color, they are gonna name it the Jeep Mama Purple and it's gonna oh. be available for public sale. So that's pretty <laughs> exciting for me. So Jeep Mama Purple, be on the lookout. So Tony and Josh, I'm gonna get a little sappy right now. So just bear with me. I just want to thank you guys both for inviting me to be a co-host with you guys on this great, fun podcast. I have such a great time. And like in my blog post yesterday, I wrote about how my blog has become my passion and has opened up so many doors for me. And one of those doors has been in this podcast. And being on this podcast has led me to the interview with Chris, which has allowed me to me slash the Jeep Talk Show to scoop all other news groups, bloggers, and podcasters with this exclusive interview and demonstration with Chris from Jeep Needs. Now, this just brings me back to my days in television news, and it's such an awesome feeling for me to be able to get to be back in videography and editing. It's an awesome feeling. So I just want to thank you both 
for allowing me to be part of this podcast. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, I'll just uh, mention that the only reason you're a uh, part of this podcast is because of who you are. So if it wasn't for you and the, your interest in Jeeps and your ability to do blogs and attract uh, people uh, to read your blog, uh, there would be no reason for you to be here. So it's really all about you, Tammy. But uh, We certainly appreciate you. Uh, well, I'll speak for myself. I certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, I don't know how Josh feels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those middle fingers I was holding up. Yeah. Uh, explained, just like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course, Tammy, I think that's great. You get a little bit nostalgic with some of that video editing and stuff, get those interviews in. I just love the content. The fact that you're yes. having fun doing this, that, 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 that means the world to me here because uh, if you're having fun and this isn't like pulling teeth for you, mm-hmm. well, hey, we're heading in the right direction. Well, I think people can sense whenever you're, uh, when you're pulling teeth, so to speak, and trying to manufacture something for uh, an audio and ah, a video. I, I'm still talking over here. Leave that alone. So uh, I'll just I'll just take this opportunity to, to be a little sappy and uh, mention uh, Dan over at the 4x4 Radio Podcast, who uh, I would like to fully blame for mentioning in a uh, chat that the uh, 4x4 Radio Network members were having one day. Uh, I can't remember if we were actually chatting or in, in, in an email, but he said, you know, sometimes it's better to pick up the phone and talk to somebody than it is to have all this electronic communications, which mm-hmm. which I've heard in the past, but I don't like talking on the phone. So whenever <laughs> whenever CPO uh, from the Jeep Needs uh, person uh, reached out to me on, uh, well, he actually he actually called into our voicemail uh, voicemail system and was mentioning this product. Uh, I just said, well, damn it, Dan said to call people, so I called uh, CPO. And spoke with him, and uh, we had a, a long and fun conversation. It was funny, too, because uh, he said, this is so weird. I'm listening to the Jeep talk show as I'm driving down to pick up my uh, my Wrangler. I think he was having a long, long arm kit put on it. And he goes, and now I'm talking to one of the people that I was listening to on the show. That's so cool. Yeah, it was. It was pretty It was pretty neat to hear that, too. So uh, anyway, spoke with him and then uh, found out he was in Maryland, uh, same place as Tammy. And uh, he was like, well, we're in, we're in Maryland uh, does Tammy live? And I said, well, does it really matter? I mean, 15 minutes, you're anywhere you want to be in the state. So <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Well, it's not- we're not that small. Well, compared <laughs> to Texas, we are. There you go. That was my point. So anyway, uh, I, I got those two together and I'm glad Tammy was uh, up for uh, going over there and meeting with CPO. And uh, it it's a really nice product. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting the uh, the test unit that Tammy currently has to, to try out on the uh, on my XJ. So you will be seeing more about the uh, the DLA here uh, very soon. I'm well, let's talk savvy. about XJ Talk, and let's talk about the sister site, Wrangler Talk, as well. Guys, both uh, premier Jeep sites on the web. But regardless of what Jeep platform you're driving, you can be sure that you're going to get expert advice and be taken very well care of. And, of course, none of that flaming, harsh criticism or any of the other stuff you'll find on some of the other sites. Now, forums aren't for you you haven't checked them out in a while, I encourage you to check out something different, wranglertalk.com or xjtalk.com. It's definitely a different atmosphere than what you're used to. I encourage you guys to check it out. Great sites. I'm a member of both. Tammy's on Wrangler Talk all the time. I'm on XJ Talk all the time. Tony is as well. You guys can find us on both as well as a whole bunch of other people who really know what they're talking about and love to help others out. So once again, that's xjtalk.com or our sister site, wranglertalk.com. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. I can, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! <laughs> Love that intro. <laughs> well, you guys, I've uh, been seeing a lot of talk about TPS, and I'm not talking about the TPS reports <laughs> uh, from Office uh, Office Space. No, I'm talking about throttle position sensors. Seems to be a, a big streak of those going dead lately, and I figured I might as well go ahead and address those. Now, uh, throttle position sensor is dead, or you think it's dead. Now what do you do? Well, the TPS is mounted on the throttle body, and it's basically a variable resistor that provides the powertrain control module, or the PCM, as the computer, with an input signal, or voltage, that represents the position of the butterfly valve inside the throttle body. That's that plate that moves back and forth as you push the gas pedal down. Now, in layman's terms, it basically uh, represents the position of that butterfly valve, uh, or it tells the computer how hard you're pushing the gas pedal. That's basically what it means. That's basically what it does. The sensor is connected to the throttle blade shaft itself. As the position of the throttle blade changes, i.e. you pressing the gas pedal down, the resistance inside the sensor changes. With changes of the resistance inside the TPS, the voltage coming out of it also changes. 
The PCM, or the computer, supplies approximately 5 volts to the entire OBD2 system family. If you guys remember a while back, one particular uh, sensor in this family was giving me the no-bus blues. Well, in the throttle position sensor, that voltage is changed by the resistance. Remember, which, if you remember, the resistance is changed by you pressing the gas pedal. Moving the throttle linkage, thus moving the butterfly valve, thus changing the position of the sensor and the voltage output back to the computer. This will vary in an approximate range of 0.26 volts at a minimum throttle opening or idle to 4.49 volts at wide open throttle. And it's this sweep between those two specific sets of numbers, specific sets of numbers, that I'm going to teach you guys how to read. That's right, you're about to learn how to troubleshoot and test your own throttle position sensor issues like a tech at the factory would. Almost all 4-liter high-output engines have a throttle position sensor, and they are all three-wire setups. This is true regardless if you have a TJ, a YJ, an XJ, an MJ, a ZJ, well, you get the idea. All you will need to do is have these, all you need to do to, uh, to do the simple procedure is have a voltmeter handy, even the cheapo ones from Harbor Freight will work, a paper clip, and a buddy, girlfriend, small child who can sit still for a few minutes and take instructions, or if you're alone, that's fine too. Unfold the paperclip about halfway. Insert the long pokey end into the space between the middle wire and the TPS plug. You're basically trying to get the paperclip to make contact with the center wire, and that, the, or the contacts of the center wire inside the plug. Yes, the TPS has to remain plugged in for this to work. Once you're confident that you've made the contact, grab the negative probe of your multimeter and wedge it into the braids of the ground strap or find another wise good enough grounding point that you can secure that probe to. Turn the ignition to the on position, but do not start the motor. Turn your multimeter on and set it to a range where 12 volts will display. Using the positive probe of your meter, make contact with that paper clip. You should see the lower range of the voltage specs. If you're reading nothing, well, then double check your connections. Worst case scenario, wedge the positive side of that probe into the center wire to secure it uh, to ensure continuity. Just don't break anything. You don't want to uh, end up uh, shearing that wire off, so be careful. With the throttle at rest or at idle, you should see less than one volt. And by having your person who's sitting in the driver's seat press down on the gas pedal, or by operating the, uh, the throttle uh, it, your, yourself at the throttle body, uh, go to wide open throttle. You should see less than five volts at that point. If you are out of spec, meaning uh, you start at two volts and you end at three volts, or you start at five volts and you end at 24 volts, well, Obviously, you have some serious issues there. <laughs> if you are out of spec at all, then you probably, uh, well, my fellow Jeeper, you have just diagnosed a bad throttle position sensor. Go to the dealership. Get yourself a replacement. Swapping it out is easy. It's just two T25 screws, Torx screws, little star-shaped bits. Uh, there's two of those screws holding it from the back of the throttle body, and uh, just unplug one, plug the other one in, bolt it in, you're good to go. Very easy and simple troubleshooting procedure to do. There are a ton of write-ups on this online, even over on our sites, xjtalk.com and wranglertalk.com. There are, of course, also lots of videos online to how to do this. Very simple, easy procedure to do. So if you've got some throttle position sensor codes that are being thrown, or you've got some, uh, some issues that you think might be a trouble, uh, troublesome uh, throttle body sensor, well, go ahead and try this procedure. Test it out. See how it ends up working out for you. And hey, give us a call. Let us know how these proceed, this procedure worked out for you. If it helped out, great. I hope it did. Uh, if not, well, let's move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, throttle position sensor is acting up on the 99. I noticed it had some uh, high RPMs, so it may have been having some problems uh, seeing where the, uh, uh, the butterfly position was. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Tony, because not a lot of people would understand what the kind of symptoms might arise from this. It could be things like um, a, a dead spot in your throttle. Uh, so like as you're taking off from a light, there's uh, some hesitation about 25% through the throttle thing or your throttle range. Um, you know, things like, uh, her, you know, jerking and herking until you press the gas pedal down farther, uh, things like that, or else it, uh, it not wanting to, uh, to rev as you start it and you give it some gas and it doesn't yeah. do anything. Those are all symptoms of a bad throttle body sensor. Yeah. Uh, the, the one that's on there actually uh, uh, was put on there because it wouldn't start. You know, actually have to uh, give the, p give the, uh, press the pedal down a little bit to get it to start and, and it wouldn't idle. So uh, I think the one that I have in there is just a spare one that I had that is not a factory. So I'd like to point out that you said go down to the dealership and get a, a throttle uh, position sensor. And I highly recommend that you do go to the Jeep dealership and get it from them. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you might make it a couple of years without any issue, but the, I think the issue is going to come back 
uh, like it has on the 99. I suspect it has on the 99. So I will be getting a, a factory uh, throttle position sensor to replace the on the 99. And like like Josh says, it's really easy to do. The hard part is uh, finding the uh, the Torx tools uh, if you don't use them very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And hey, guys, another easy sensor to pull out at the junkyard and a great one to throw in your toolbox uh, or in your uh, tool bag when you guys are out on the trails. It's a very good, very easy to store spare to have uh, in your little bag of tricks. Yep, exactly. Yeah, when those uh, when those sensors go bad, uh, it, it'll ruin your day, uh, especially yeah, trying yeah. to get trying to get back home. So hey, another thing that's uh, mighty tricky. Well, at least uh, some tips and tricks uh, coming from this guy. It's the Grand Adventure with Cody from TrailChasers.net. Hey guys, it's Cody with TrailChasers.net with another Grand Adventure. Uh, let me start by saying, what the f- are you kidding me with this? Sh- Okay, what I meant to say was I've been having some trouble with the WJ. Wow. So uh, a few <laughs> weeks ago, the engine was kind of sputtering at idle. And uh, it felt to me like it was a fuel delivery issue because when I put my foot into the gas, it ran fine. Uh, so based on my past experience working on motorcycles, the first thing we would do in that case was change the fuel filter. So I did. We changed the fuel filter on the WJ, put in some fuel injector cleaner, uh, ran some 91 octane, and uh, that seemed to help. It, it sputtered once or twice after that, um, but not nearly like it was doing before. So th- I was ready to take it wheeling uh, about a week after I did that fuel filter uh, change out. And I've been waiting to wheel for a long time. I had a, a month prior to the baby coming where I didn't want to go anywhere. And then the baby's been here for a month. And so it's it's been two week, at least two months since I've been able to take it out wheeling. So I met up with a group of guys um, and we took off up towards Big Bear where there was some fresh Southern California snow, which we don't get very often. And about not even halfway up the hill, the Jeep started to overheat. We popped the hood and saw that the fan was spinning, but at a much slower rate than we would have expected. So while my friends went and played in the snow, I had to turn around and come home like a kid that had to be home before the streetlights are on. And I got to tell you, it was a long drive home. And the whole time I was thinking about how for the next two years, I'm going to have to come onto this show and talk about how my engine's overheating and how I can't figure it out and what's going on with my Jeep heat. And who wants to listen to that? Nobody. Why? Because it's just Thank not you. good podcasting. <laughs> So then I got home and I figured I would change out the fan motor. So I started making some phone calls trying to find a replacement fan because it's not a it's not a fan that's attached to the pulley. It it appears to be appeared to be an electric fan motor. So no one could find the part that I needed. And I called Jeep and the guy says, hey, just so you know, there's not an electric fan on that. It's a hydraulic fan. Yeah. Yeah. Some Einstein McBrainy pants at Chrysler decided to put a (laughs) hydraulic fan motor in these engines. It uses the power steering fluid and a solenoid. As the engine temperature heats up, the solenoid opens and it pushes more power steering fluid through the fan motor and spins the fan. The replacement module, the whole replacement fan module is (laughs) $1,250 at your local (laughs) Jeep dealership. Uh, uh, What the hell (laughs) okay so i'm not spending 1250 bucks i started doing some troubleshooting and fortunately 20 years in the building automation industry has taught me about fans and and solenoids and switches and was able to jump out some of the controls and got the solenoid to open and when the solenoid opens that fan does spin so there's got to be an issue with the wiring or or the module that's sending the 12 volt dc to the solenoid I started tracing that back. I did some Googling online and found on someone's post, they mentioned a uh, fuse for the CO2 sensor being tied into that circuit. So sure enough, you open up the fuse block and there's a fuse there that says CO2 sensor. It doesn't say anything about uh, oil sensor. It doesn't say anything about the solenoid. And interestingly, when I plugged in my OBD2 module, I had a solenoid failure and a a CO2 sensor failure. So I pulled that fuse out and it was blown. I grabbed another fuse, put it in the fuse block, and it instantly blew out. So I definitely have a short someplace. 
and I need to trace it down. So today I'm going to dig in, start following some wire and see where I can find that short uh, because I'm not spending $12.50 for a new fan module. Worst case scenario, um, I will rip the whole thing out and swap in an electric fan module. Um, I've also read that some guys put the standard uh, fan on a on the uh, main pulley and they never had problems after that. But while doing this troubleshooting, I'm wondering if the failed CO2 sensor, the blown fuse, was contributing to the sputtering in the first place. So hopefully for your sake, I don't have to come on here once a week for the next eternity Swearing. and talk about how I <laughs> bought some crazy temperature module from Australia that had the wrong <laughs> sensor rating in Celsius and and then I don't know what the problem is. And I'll try to spare you all that and I'll just fix Thank it. You. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Oh, Excellent. You know, funny, when very he funny. Started, when he started <laughs> like beeping at the beginning, I thought, oh my God, he really needs to get some sleep. That baby's keeping him up. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, well, I'll done. tell you a little. I'll tell you a little secret. I told uh, Cody when he first started, uh, you know, coming on the show, and we were talking about doing the segment. And I said, "Swearing's fine, Cody. Uh, I think it's funny when we bleep things out." So, not only did he swear, he bleeped his. Uh, he bleeped himself as well. So, I, oh, I was going to say, did you have to bleep him, or did he bleep himself? I've, I've, I've had to do it in the past, and I've always been a little nervous with him because, uh, you know, I, when I edit, I don't have the time to sit and listen to the whole thing. So right. I jump. I jump around. But he was he was good enough to bleep his bleep himself. Now, that didn't That's sound good. right. <laughs> <laughs> that goes uh, right alongside my comment earlier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, between Cody and I, we're covering the nation. <laughs> and th- with the new baby, he can't afford twelve hundred dollars for a fan. Oh, no. there's, like I, I like he said, there's got to be a replacement that is not. Uh, I can't believe they put anything like that in the. In a, it's a Jeep for for God's sake! Come on. Yeah, honestly, I think his his best option is going to be ditching that whole system oh, yes. with an electric fan. It's going to free up horsepower. It, it's going to eliminate one thing to troubleshoot. Uh, hydraulic fan. Come on. I couldn't believe that. I'm glad he shared that information. I had no idea, but that's what you, what you get when you drive a yuppie vehicle. You get yuppie things. Well. <laughs> Well, good information there on the WJs, and we can look forward to uh, more, much more of those tips and tricks coming from Cody and, uh, and really good job uh, taking uh, Tony to task there and kind of calling him out with the, uh, with the whole temperature thing. That was some good times there. Thanks again, Cody. If you can check him and uh, his stuff out, trailchasers.net, and we'll be looking forward to more Grand Adventure coming up in later episodes of the Jeep Talk Show. And if you ever, uh, if you have more overheating issues with your vehicle and you don't talk to about it, talk to us about it, I'll know. <laughs> Tony's the king of heating issues. I'll know, and I'll make sure I ask you about that on a live upcoming show. (laughs) Well, and Jeep Mama is the queen of the product review, and she's got one here, a familiar product. We've actually heard about it earlier in the show. Yeah, like I I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about the DLA, which is the D-Lift Adapter. It's a new product on the market, and I have one right here. And the DLA is a solidly built product. Like I mentioned in Wrangler Talk earlier, it is made with a single piece of steel, cold rolled and bent into shape. It is topped with a non-marring surface for those times when you're looking to jack up your vehicle from those not so normal spots. And it's power coated in many different colors, including soon the Jeep Mama Purple. Um, It weighs just under five pounds, and I actually have only used this once myself, but I found it simple and easy to use, and I attach it to my D-ring on my aftermarket bumper on my Jeep. Now, I've seen it demoed three times, and I feel it lives up to its claims. Now, you can head over to the Jeep Talk Show YouTube channel for the demonstration on how the DLA works. Well, hopefully, we'll have that video up later this evening or tomorrow. Now, all in all, I think this is a great product. However, I found removing the pin, it's got like a little pulley thing that you have to pull out. I find this difficult to use due to the weakness I have in my hands because I have mild arthritis. But you strong men, I'm sure, can pull it out no problem. Anyway, I will say I have always taken my vehicles to the shop to get the work done on them 
or even get my tires changed. So to use a high lift jack for me is a very scary thought. And I actually have never used a high lift jack before because of all the warnings I have heard about how dangerous they can be. So the first time I used one was with Chris from Jeep's Needs, who I mentioned earlier, when he was demoing the DLA for me. When it was my turn to use the DLA, I attached the DLA to my high lift, to my D-ring, to my Jeep. And I started jacking up my Jeep. So here's a little video, and I want you to listen carefully. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And once you start putting the whole weight of the vehicle, you can feel it. Okay, so... For those of you who are just listening, I suggest when you get to a point where you can actually watch a video, you should go to www.jeeptalkshow.com and you can see during this podcast the video of myself jacking up my Rubicon for my first time ever. Now, when you watch this video, you'll be able to see I don't have a whole lot of upper body strength and it was very difficult for me to lift up the Wrangler and I needed to put my whole body into it. Now, without the DLA, there's no way I could have done this successfully. Now, I would give this product five stars, and with safety in mind, I don't think the price is an issue. Tony and Josh? I'm looking forward to uh, actually putting my hands, my hot little hands, as my mom would say, on the on one of those, uh, just because uh, it looks like it's a very well-built piece of uh of, uh, of machinery of uh, thing. I don't know if you call it a machine. It's just, uh, I guess it is a very simple machine, but I really like the idea that it's not welded. They just uh, bent it into that shape. And uh, I also like how they have the ability to make uh, changes very quickly. Uh, like they did with your uh, uh, D ring, the worn D ring that wouldn't quite right. fit. And for me personally, it's going to be, I'm going to be very curious to see how my, experience with it is going to compare to yours because you have way more experience in lifting using a high lift jack than I ever will. And you have way more experience in just Jeep stuff, period. So it's, well, to I, me, it's I, going to be I, interesting to see the, the difference in I don't, I, I don't want to over. I don't want you overstating it. I have a lot more experience uh, lifting up the Jeep, working on the Jeep, driving the Jeep every day longer in, in time. But, uh, uh, not not much off road experience, and no. actually the high lift is uh, is fairly new to me. I've probably only used the high lift uh, five or six times, but that's more like right. five or six times more than I have. Right. So, so uh, yeah, it, it was actually interesting seeing some of that uh, the video where uh, CPO uh, was uh, doing the shift over uh, or lift up the the Jeep and then shift it over. Although now, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably piss a lot of people off here, and uh, I'm just gonna take the uh, the opposite uh, side of the coin here and say that that I've done a lot of off road recovery. I've used my own high lift jack and other people's high lift jacks uh, in many kinds of situations, off road and down in the staging area. Um, I've used my own high lift jack on my own GP recently, even mm -hmm. uh, to separate the body from the suspension a little bit more to make it easier for me to uh, put my oil pan back on. Um, and that was just in my garage because it was handy. It was there and <clears throat> it'll jack it to the moon too. Cause it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, I, I have found this to be, uh, I found this to be an, a, an unuseful tool for somebody who knows what they're doing. That being said, I see the value and the importance in something like this for a new off-roader who is probably going to get themselves, who have, if they have an adventurous enough spirit to get themselves into a situation where they could possibly get stuck and use their high lift jack. And if they haven't done it several times before, I can see the trepidation. I can see the fear where that would come from and, and this providing some peace of mind and some security. This would be something that I would have absolutely no use for uh, because I, I can use a high lift jack relatively easily and deftly without the use of such things. Uh, that being said, I'm all for safety equipment and, and making sure that people out there are, are you know, putting themselves in as safe a position as possible when recovering a vehicle. Uh, so again, I can see the value in this. It's just not something that I would ever have use for personally. But uh, I do recommend you guys out there, if, if a high lift jack is something that you haven't used before, if you own one and you've never used one before, 
Uh, or if you are new to off-roading and you're worried about uh, you're, you're kind of increasing your skill level and getting to some of those harder trails uh, and you want something to add to your recovery bag that's going to make things a lot easier for you and safer for you, then definitely I would recommend a DLA. So uh, I'll just uh, I'll just say that uh, Josh, I agree with you. I mean, it's almost it, from what you're saying, it's almost like the way I am with the tread uh, the, the tread lightly stuff. Uh, I I understand the the importance of tread lightly. I understand how uh, the the non off roading community likes to point out, uh, oh, you tore this up, and we need to close these lands down, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I am of the mindset, screw it. <laughs> you know, it's dirt. It's it's a tree, you know. Uh, I don't. I'm not all for uh, uh, strangling trees without using tree savers. Uh, uh, trees are good things to have. They produce oxygen. But I mean, it, a lot of this stuff is just kind of wussified. So it, it's almost like what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong here. It's like I know how to use a high lift jack. I'm not worried about scratching my vehicle. It's an off road vehicle. Uh, so what do I care about? Uh, I can I can do it safe uh, safe in my own way. I don't need something that is twice the the price of of my high lift jack uh, to put on there. And and, and I you could th- say that about anything. Well, no, I I don't think you can. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, that Chris was talking about was a, a light that was two hundred and fifty dollars, and he was equating this hundred and sixty dollar thing. A light I can use at any any time. It's ready to go, and I can. It helps me see whenever you have but, this thing that you put on on your your jack. I, I'm just saying, but there I are a wouldn't lot of mind people having who have lights on their jeeps who never use them for off roading. Right. Well, and they don't use them at all right. because you can't use them on road. But right. what but what I'm saying what I'm saying is is that I think this is a an excellent product, and I would definitely like to have one but not at the price point that they're offering it. I, I would agree with Tony on that. And just say the bottom line here is basically th- this product is not necessarily for everybody. Uh, no. But there is going to be a, a large market for this item nonetheless. And, and I can see the value and the importance of it. Um, just, you know, I was making the point that, again, it's not for everybody. No, well, and, and you're right. And, you know, I, for me personally, to use a high lift jack by myself would be stupid. I have, I don't well, know how to I, use one that, properly and I don't have the strength to use one. So this would do. be a good thing for me personally. I was going to say, yeah, this would definitely right. be a good thing, good thing for you, but just because of the position that you're in and, and there are millions of people out there just like you. Uh, there's right. also a million people out there just like me, just like Tony. And we've got some right. opinions. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's a lid for every pot. Right. Right. I just want to make sure that you guys, not every the, the listeners out there, Jeep understand person. that uh, uh, we all know where you're coming from. We're not trying to soft pedal uh, this product to anybody, telling you it's the greatest no. thing since sliced bread. I think it's a, it, I think it's a very be. exciting uh, a piece of equipment. I look forward to uh, testing it out and uh, perhaps changing my opinion as far as everybody whether they should have it or not. But just my gut feeling is. You can use a high lift jack without this thing. This thing would make it uh, easier uh, to use because uh, you don't have to worry about it uh, sl- you know, sliding off or scratching something. But I think you guys understand how I am about my Jeep. I'm not worried about scratching my bumper. <laughs> I just it's not I, it's not even powder coated. It's, well, that's, it's, it's just that's spray painted just, with black paint. I can repaint right. the bumper. No, that's just the polycarbonate thing. But the locking part of it from you know the scratching my jeep i don't care about it either. no but that's the one of the things one of the reasons of the why they put that on there right. was to keep from scratching the bumper right right my bumper is so scratched up yep so there you Broding. go but yeah. but we'll be giving you more information on the dla and again i think it's a really nice product and i suspect although i haven't heard i suspect as they uh, sell these things the price probably will come down because you guys know that whenever something's brand new and you haven't sold very many of them uh, the price is more expensive. So uh, you guys hurry up and buy a bunch so I can afford one. Those purple ones. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Nothing wrong with purple, Josh. I got a purple shirt on today. Yeah, Josh, Josh is anti-purple. <laughs> uh, my high school colors were purple and gold. so I. Oh, I well, that's geez. Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> Woo! We were the Lake Washington Kangs. Close. What the hell is that big yellow thing you're holding, Tammy? <laughs> it'll soon it'll soon be in your hands, Tony. <laughs> I will mail it to you soon. Merry Christmas. Yep, the DLA is coming down. And something I didn't mention is is that uh, 
uh, once I get done with that uh, that little unit, we're going to be doing a giveaway of it uh, to one of our listeners, and we'll have to determine how we're going to uh, figure out who who's getting the uh, the DLA uh, here in upcoming uh, shows. So so stick a around. Battle and, to the death. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a high lift uh, off, a jack off. No, that wouldn't be right. Oh. Well, now. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, well, Tony got his in. I think we're all, all we need is Tammy to have a Freudian slip, and we'll be uh, we'll be four for four. So, uh, Tony, what is going on in the Jeep world with you? I, I like the idea <clears throat> of the giveaway. That's cool. We'll have to be teasing that as the shows uh, in upcoming shows. What's, uh, what's going on with the – you said something about 3.6, 3.8 liters – Earlier in the show, you wanted to talk about the uh, the JK the JKU. I have been appalled to find out that there seems to be a insidious plot inside of Jeep and Chrysler Uh-oh. selling substandard engines Uh-oh. in their JKs and JKUs and and I guess minivans because I think that the what was it the three six or the three eight that was uh, that was in the minivans it was the three eight wasn't it? God, actually, I want to say it was the three six. Tammy, was what was kind of what's in your uh, what's in your uh, your your Rubicon? Is it a three six or a three eight? She's blinking. She doesn't know. I know. No, I want. I'm I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure it's a three point six. I think the three point eight was the older one. Okay, so the three point eight is probably what was in the minivans uh, then. But uh, I've got some uh, some interesting information that we'll be sharing on the upcoming show. Probably not the next episode. But the following episode, uh, I guess that would be our 2016 episode. Uh, don't quote me on that, but just uh, uh, doing the math in my head. Don't panic, Josh. Uh, it's my math. And uh, oh, but be uh, no math. got some pictures, got some videos, got some uh, interesting information from some three point six from from, from uh, service techs at uh, Jeep Chrysler. So. Uh, I'm just a little disturbed because, you know, I was actually thinking if I ever hit the lottery and I wanted to buy me a new Jeep, it would be probably a JKU. And uh, now I don't know what to get. I, it's almost seemingly like I need to, uh, if I'm going to get a JKU, I need to buy a Hemi with it. Uh, aren't they putting Hemis in uh, JKs yet, uh, Josh? Didn't you report on that a while back? Well, there's definitely kits out there. I, I no, know but I mean from the factory. Oh, from the factory. Well, there's uh, there was talks about it, like an SRT Hellcat version of okay. the Wrangler. So that they're was not coming doing out. It. Uh, yeah. It's it's all concept stuff yeah. right now. That's a shame. So I uh, get a new JKU, uh, get a, a crate engine Hemi, and take it down to uh, my favorite uh, uh, shop and have it all swapped out, and then uh, we can beat the hell out of that three point six. <laughs> I like my three point six. Well, of course you do. How many miles you got on it? Three. Nine thousand and eight. So, uh, oh, uh, and also too, I have been told that there is a way that you can tell when your uh, three point six is getting ready to take the the big dump. So yeah. uh, there will be coming up with uh, tips and tricks of uh, how you can tell uh, when it's time to put your JKU on the uh, used car market before it uh, has to go back to Chrysler and uh, have a new engine uh, put in it. I'm not giving up my Rubicon. <laughs> well, you don't have to if, as, long as, as long as you're w- willing to spend money because you can always replace the engine. Well, uh, but boy, that is, that's, a, that's a hell of a thing. Uh, uh, the, the source that I had, it took the dealership six weeks to replace the engine. Anyway, I'm not going to I'm not going to say any more about it. We'll uh, we'll wait and uh, bring that information to you on a upcoming episode. If you guys have any information, personal information, whether uh, whether it's good or bad about the 3.6 or 3.8, I uh, actually I say I we would love to hear from you because I'd like to collect some information on this. I'm hearing that if you can get 120,000 miles out of your 3.6, you're damn lucky and you should play the lottery. <laughs> That that's almost verbatim from what I was told. So that pretty much mirrors a lot of the sentiments that I've heard as well. But uh, but yeah, that's. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's out there there there's some that are out there that'll go two or three hundred thousand miles. Uh, uh, there were four liter fine. engines that were lemons out of the factory. Mm-hmm. There's bad apples in every bunch. But this does seems to be mean, widespread. This this issue does seem to be much more widespread than any issue that I've heard with about the four liter other than maybe the 1330 cracked head Mm -hmm. uh, issue. But uh, but aside from that, that was a very narrow year band. Uh, And again, just one small issue. Uh, This longevity issue seems to be going a little bit more. Really sad. This is not Jeep ish. I have an engine that, 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 that 
mimic something from the 70s and the 80s uh, where you couldn't get more than 60, 70,000 miles out of a vehicle before you had to uh, replace well, it. Well, my last weekend wasn't very Jeepish either. I did not get a chance to work on my Jeep as I was hoping I was uh, going to. I, instead, I had to hang Christmas lights uh, most of the weekend. <laughs> had to. Uh, that was, that <laughs> Josh, Josh had, was being I had Chevy to. Chase. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in fact, uh, yeah, no, the, it, I, you guys know that I go all out for my Halloween displays, weather providing. Uh, Christmas time, I'm kind of the same way. Oh, really? Uh, it's it's like family Griswold out in my front yard right now. It's 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 pretty lit up pretty well. Uh, but uh, no, I had to throw away six strands of lights today or today uh, th- this last weekend. I probably spent a good solid four hours trying to troubleshoot, fix, and repair <laughs> these different strands of uh, of lights. Did you have the big knotted ball? Like on Christmas no, no, vacation, I, you know, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty pretty savvy when it comes to wire management. So no, all all my you know cords get all wrapped up and and tied up and everything, and everything's all kind of you know in its place and everything. It's you know OCD over here. Yeah, I wish uh, I was but, your neighbor because I would have walked up and said, "Did you check all the bulbs?" Hey. <laughs> hey, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure, always. I've been driving around at night lately, which I normally don't drive around like drive around at night. But I've been seeing these homes, and it looks like they have net lights on the homes. Yes. Have oh, you seen that? No. It's so. It, what the? You guys probably saw those on Groupon. If you guys are a Groupon subscriber, and you probably saw the uh, the laser projector uh, lights that get. Uh, they basically oh. throw a cascade of lights over the entire house, and it's just a fancy laser projector. Is, something is all it uh, is. something you used to see on uh, Ghost Hunters because they would use basically a, the same type thing for so, so you could detect motion. With all those little dots of uh, laser light, laser lights. How does it look, Tammy? Is it is it neat looking? Because I thought this I would be. I think it looks really. I I swear to God, it looked like you know how they had the net lights for the the bushes. Uh huh. I thought it was like a net light that you throw over your house. You see, this is a light, a lighting, a Christmas lighting of the house I could get behind, where you just plop the thing in the the front yard and you turn it on right. and you go back in the house. <laughs> Right. Yeah. The the problem with that is the uh, the FAA is starting to come down on those because those laser those lights are bastards. actually starting to interfere, interfere right. with pilots at night. So, <laughs> yeah, Dan, if you do, Dan, if you don't, they need to keep their eye on the road, not be looking down at the houses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, I uh, I didn't get a chance to do uh, do really anything on the Jeep uh, this last weekend. Going to try and get something in this weekend, but uh, tomorrow. I'm actually going to be spending uh, pretty much most of the evening and night after work uh, working on a 2012 Ford Raptor. Uh, I'm going to be doing a full LED light install on that thing. Uh, he's going to, let's see, there's two, four. He's got four, five different sets of pod lights, uh, a set of pod lights for the rear for, for reverse, and then two bar lights that I'll, I'll be hooking up. So uh, that, that's a lot light. of LEDs going onto a 2012 Ford Raptor. What was that? Tammy? When you say pod light, what do you mean by pod light? Oh, there's the the small little LED pods. You know, they got like they got like four little uh, four little. Um, oh, okay, like the ones that I would have on my front of my Jeep. Yeah, so these aren't probably. like the the headlights or the tail lights. These are extra. no, these aren't headlights or tail lights. But he is using one oh, okay. set. Uh, he got some new aftermarket bumpers on his uh, on his okay. Raptor, and uh, and he wants to uh, put in a set of reverse lights uh, or a hole lights, as I call them, because they're not going to be hooked up to the actual reverse lights. They're going to be hooked up to a switch. <laughs> yeah. Back off, a-hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get it. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, damn it, there was something I was going to ask you about. Oh, um, the uh, the LEDs. Or were, you, yeah. were you talking about doing the dash, the interior dash as well? Or No, this is all exterior lights. Okay, uh, But I will be integrating into the factory switches. Um, I believe they're called like the uplifter switches on some of the um, some of the F-350s. And the Ford Raptors have a set of these as well. They're integrated little toggle switches that are uh, backlit as well. Uh, that Ford has integrated into um, the center console and on the F-350s on the left side of the steering column. Uh, and I will be tying the, these this entire aftermarket lighting system uh, into the OEM switches, which should be a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's going to be a lot of under-the-dash work. So let me ask you, uh, or let me mention this to you, maybe for a future uh, upcoming uh, electrical and audio tips, which you have been threatening to do. I have been threatening to do those for a while now. <laughs> yeah. I was back. Yeah, I would them. love to change my uh, incandescent bulbs in my dash to LEDs. Oh, yeah. But LEDs don't dim. No, they don't, unfortunately. Uh, there is a way around that. So, so don't, that. So, yeah, don't, don't give it away because I'm thinking no. this would be a really cool electrical and audio uh, tip 
that people, a lot of people would be interested in because I know I'm interested in it because I'd love to have that LED look, but I want to be able to dim it. I don't want to be, you know, shielding my arms while I'm trying to see something, especially when it's in the fog and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I actually have a write-up on xjtalk.com about how to switch the LEDs behind your switches uh, in your late model Cherokee uh, in the center console. Uh, it's a great little write-up on how to uh, how to do that. Uh, and uh, similar principles can be applied with some extra tips that we'll get into in another show uh, to get that dimmability. Um, Tony and Josh, you know, remember last week I had that little blooper video? Yeah. Where it sounded like I was off-roading again, where I went, oh, my God. I get the feeling you do that in the middle of the, the doctor's office or in yeah, the I, uh, in the, the store yeah. whenever the, they put the new meat out. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just standard. Anyway, um, when I was doing that, Chris from Jeep's Needs was demonstrating the lift and shift, ne- shift method. Now, I have never heard of the lift and shift method. And, you know, I. You've never been stuck? No, I haven't. <laughs> and That'd be different um, from lift and separate. Yes. <laughs> and, I, you know, I know, I know, to- Josh, you could probably do this all on your own without the DLA. Right. <laughs> and that is, you know, that's really awesome that you can. And t- to me personally, I would be scared to death to try that without the DLA. And I'm like, ex- don't want to get high centered, but I think it would be exciting, kind of maybe, to get high centered <laughs> to be able to try this on Option my own. To learn, yeah. But for for some of you, hopefully, there's some new listeners out there. And if you're a listener, I suggest you go over to once we download this talk show, or this podcast, go to JeepTalkShow.com and you can watch this. But Chris showed me the lift and shift me- method, and at the time I was videotaping this, it was kind of scary for me. But after seeing it and knowing that I would have the DLA to back me up, I think it, I could try this on my own. But here it is. So there's a recovery technique called the lift and shift. If you're high centered and you just need to move over for some reason, I'm going to get both tires. See? Oh I'm my shifting. gosh. <laughs> Now, I just shifted over, I don't know, a couple inches, three or four inches. So I'm going to jack it up again. Now, if that DLA was not on just there, that jack would have slipped right off the Jeep, Yeah, usually right? what happens is as you shift the vehicle, the jack will kick out underneath, and then you, you know, you pick it up off the ground. And So I'm getting it up. And then a little pressure. Oh... Uh. I just shifted it over another six inches or so. And it just makes a difference knowing that it's not coming off the bike. Right. Yeah, that is really cool how you uh, you don't have to worry about that thing shifting around. And then I can certainly see that where the, the jack would fall. But come on, what's the big deal? It falls over, you pick it up, you put it back on there, you, you jack up the, the Jeep well, and, and then shift it over again. Well, I would like to just make two points sometimes it's not gonna move because there's so much pressure where i think physics would play into it where it's gonna you know there's so much weight on it it's gonna hold the jack into the ground the other time it it may kick up and if you're standing in the wrong place Mm. you could you know you know, well, if you're not experienced, well, I'll in tell it. you this much, Tammy. Whenever he was, I had that high lift jack within uh, a half inch of the very top of the bar. I was, I was looking forward to seeing that thing break in half and take out a leg, because uh, uh, right. that's a lot of pressure on that on that bar. Josh, have you ever seen a high lift jack break? I have not. I've. I I've, like hearing well, that. Uh, not, not. No, I've seen the uh, the the mechanism fail. Right. That's okay. And a, Jeep, and a Jeep come crashing, but I actually I haven't seen the cast iron break. Oh, good. I like. No, I that. will. I will say in the longer version of this video that we will put on um, the Jeep Talk Show um, YouTube channel during testing of the DLA, where they had I forget the name of the kind of testing they did the. Jack broke before the DLA. I wonder what broke on it. Uh, if it was the mechanism or the the cast I, iron part, because that you I know that's that's know, like a, a two by four in my mind uh, <laughs> fracturing. It would just scare the hell out of me. 
Uh, I'm always worried about that when I'm messing with that high lift jack, but they're fairly uh, new to me. I mean, it's a heavy piece of metal. I wouldn't expect right. for it to break, but then again, that's uh, that's kind of the last thing some people say. I didn't expect for it to break. Uh, thank, thank you for bringing me here, God. <laughs> and I'd like to also point out, <laughs> I I thought I had a high lift jack. I I do not have a high lift jack. Well, I you thought high Smith. lift was a generic term. You didn't know it was right. A brand I did. Name. I thought high lift was like frisbee or Kleenex or it's not. It, to, it's not. I have a Smitty built jack, which is a what do they call them? Um, Chinese farm farm, farm jack. Yeah, farm that's jack. Kind of what they yes. Now high lift right. is the manufacturer, mm-hmm. and you know people just tend to like Kleenex or Frisbee or whatever they call all of them high lift and high lift. This was designed for the actual high lift jack, not all of the types of high lift jacks. So you need to, before you purchase this, you need to make sure you have the high lift jack. It did uh, and, not work with my Smitty built jack. Guys, uh, I'm going to just give you a, a little bit of advice here. Do not uh, do not invest in or rely on a Harbor Freight farm farm jack. Yes, the farm, price is That's right. But trust me, that mechanism is not something that you want to uh, rest your life or your Jeep on. So just, you know, it might get you out of one situation. It might not. Uh, I personally wouldn't trust it. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where, you know, if it comes down to whether or not my vehicle is going to make this make it out of this, or whether or not I'm going to make it out of this or not, uh, you know, I want to put that on something that I can, you know, bet the bank on. And a high lift jack is going to do that. Harbor Freight one, I'm not going to have as much reliability in. And never, ever crawl under your Jeep, whether oh. it is a high lift or anything else that is jack related, even one of those hydraulic jacks. Always put something between uh, the Jeep and the ground that will give you enough time to get the hell out of there, especially if you're off road. Especially if you're off road. And you know, folks, don't forget, go to the Jeep Talk Show YouTube channel tomorrow. Subscribe, and you can watch all these great videos. This exclusive interview and demonstration that we had with Jeep's Needs, and subscribe. A lot more video that you'll be able to see there on the YouTube site because we didn't want to... uh, uh, do a, a 30 minute or however long it was uh, that Tammy uh, uh, spoke with Chris or CPO. But uh, we did want to make all that uh, great footage and questions uh, interview available to our audience. And uh, uh, even if you're not uh, part of our audience and shame on you if you're not. Well, if that's it, guys, let's uh, get over to Wheeling Where. Yeah, not a whole lot going on in the nation as far as wheeling events go, guys. But uh, I know there's some charity events that are happening. In fact, I've got one happening in my uh, neck of the woods that I'll be going to this weekend. So I've told you guys about that at length here the last couple few weeks. Uh, so it's uh, we're getting towards the end of the year, guys, and uh, running out of time to get in those winter events. So if you've got a winter event coming up in your area, let's go ahead and get the word out. You guys can send us an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. Don't forget, Jeep Junkies, wherever you are wheeling, if you pack it in, make sure you pack it out. Let's leave our outdoor recreation spots in as good, if not better condition than they were when we arrived. Always stay on designated trails, and remember, don't wheel where you're not supposed to. Always a good idea to tread lightly. That's it for this week, guys. If you got an event coming up in your area, let's get that word out, whether it's a show and shine, a cruise in, or a club run, fundraiser, huge event like the Easter Jeep Safari. Give us, uh, Let us know by giving us a call or sending us an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. And Jeepers, we know you guys are making purchases all the time. We see it every other week on our Amazon You Bought What segment. Next time you guys order your Jeep parts, ask the business if ask the business, ask the business <laughs> if they know about the Jeep Talk Show. Got some ghetto coming out and meeting them tonight. Let them know just how much you guys enjoy the podcast. If you're buying a product or service from a vendor because of a review or a discussion you heard here on the show, let the vendor know. And if they don't already know about the show, be sure and tell them about the one and only Jeep Talk Show. I want to remind you guys about uh, us on the Twitter and on the Facebook. Uh, you will see Tammy and I both active on both those platforms uh, at Jeep Talk Show and uh, Facebook slash uh, Jeep Talk Show. Tammy's been doing quite a few things uh, up on uh, pictures and stuff on Twitter, and she's even taken to uh, signing it Jeep Mama because she knows it's being put out there as uh, as Jeep Talk Show. So I guess you're, uh, you're you're wanting to take credit for some of that stuff, huh, Tammy? Oh, well, I'm not necessarily wanting to take credit. I just want <laughs> to make sure people aren't like, what is Tony posting? 
Well, it's the Jeep talk show. It could be anybody. It could be a a social media intern that we've hired, right? Why is Tony Topless again? (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, speaking of anybody, anybody and everybody out there has got a Jeep story to tell, and we want to hear from you guys. We do have a fourth seat open, guys. It could be for you. If you have a Jeep story you want to tell, you maybe you're in a very uh, interesting spot in your build, or maybe you just want to share the latest carnage story from your last wheeling trip. Well, let's know. Let us know about it. Send us an email or drop us a line. 530-675-4102. We hope to hear from you very soon. Yes, yes. We would love to hear from you if you are a uh, Jeep Renegade owner, a uh uh, one of those trail chickens, uh, either uh, the uh, the new 2014-2015 Cherokee uh, or uh, really any of the Jeeps that are out there. We'd love to hear from you. would love to have you on the show and love you have you do a segment for us. Uh, everything Jeep. We're all about Jeeps here, whether uh, we like them or not. <laughs> hey, guys, don't forget our mobile site is up and oh, running yeah. and working better than ever. So if you haven't checked us out lately, make sure you head over to JeepTalkShow.com. I'm glad somebody was listening. I, I forgot all about that. I said, we need to push the mobile site. <laughs> And then I forget about it. Uh, yeah, it's really cool because you can go there to the to our webpage, jeeptalkshow.com. And if you're on a smartphone, it will format to that screen and you can just press the play button and listen to it right there. Uh, what is it all, they always say, guys? Uh, uh, you're uh, uh, texting, not texting the... Man uh, with hand in pocket, feel cocky. <laughs> no? <laughs> Okay, we need to get Have you in. I thought weekend, that's what they always say. <laughs> we I, need to get I, you and uh, Nikki G together. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh no no I, I want to say texting <laughs> rates apply but what is it where you may uh because if you're if you're listening to the show from your phone make sure you're on wi-fi or you got a, a, a big uh, bandwidth plan because you're going to be using your bandwidth anyway you guys have a great jeep week we'll see you next week texting transactions and data rates may apply there you go that's what i was looking for i just wanted to plug that into your head so you you would go you know press the <laughs> button so you'd go push the button make the monkey talk <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tammy, the end of the year is coming up, and you know that means Christmas and New Year's. I I don't know if you ever uh, talk about what you get for Christmas, but I think it'd be fun to hear from our listeners about what they got for Christmas. And, of course, their New Year's uh, uh, resolutions, maybe their Jeep resolutions. Right. I think it's you know good idea to let us know what your Jeep resolutions are, what you're going to do to your Jeep. Is there anything different you're going to do this year? Um, Because it helps give other people ideas on what they can do with their Jeep, what maybe I can do with my Jeep, maybe add a little bit more purple to my Jeep, do you think? (laughs) I don't think it's possible. Maybe a little less purple? I don't know. (laughs) So call in to our voicemail line. You know it very well by now, 530-675-4102, or use our speak pipe at jeeptalkshow.com. Warning, the Jeep Talk Show is intended for entertainment purposes only. Use as directed. Any relation to actual information, real Jeeps, or persons living or dead are purely coincidental. The Jeep Talk Show is not responsible for lost or stolen items, and some assembly is required. For a full list of restrictions and contest rules, see store for details. Batteries not included. The Jeep Talk Show is for external use only. Contents under pressure. Side effects may include vertigo, uncontrollable laughter, or greasy discharge and false kung fu powers. The Jeep Talk Show and its contents are known to cause cancer in the state of California. It is probably not a federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. The Jeep Talk Show may be a choking hazard. Keep out of reach of small children. All safety precautions must be observed when using the Jeep Talk Show. If you feel you've reached this recording in error, please hang up and try your call again.